Kennedy's last American radio broadcast, he and I spoke between rehearsals on a Wednesday in Avery Fisher Hall. And here is an edited tape, and I stress the word, I'm sorry, unedited tape. I stress the word unedited because you'll hear some extraneous conversation. You'll hear Mr. Bernstein go into an impromptu commercial for Iberia Airlines. And there are some other interesting subjects which we covered. Mort. After the messages, that you have, when you yes, said, when I come back, that's my understanding, right. Lenny, or exactly. Chris, or whatever. Sure. A full retake? Sure. Leonard Bernstein conducted the New York Philharmonic in this CBS Masterworks recording from 1977 of the 4C interludes from Benjamin Britten's opera, Peter Grimes. Mr. Bernstein is my guest on today's program, and we'll be back after these messages. You see sunny Spain, Iberia, Airline. Hey! Lenny, at the risk of stating the obvious, we all know that you have a special feeling for and relationship to the music of Mahler. Um, when did all that begin? I guess it all began when I first heard the first note that I ever heard by Mahler which was on a recording uh, when I was a college student, sophomore, I think. Um, maybe, maybe, no, I was a sophomore. I had a roommate who had a phonograph, which was much more than I had, a little square box, which you had to wind a lot. And he had a pretty good collection of 78 records, 78s. Among them, um, was Das Lied von der Erde, conducted by Bruno Walter. And of course, I went out of my mind and used to listen to it like an addict. Um, and thought, and that did occur to me that someday I might do it because I had no ambition and the time to be a conductor never would have entered my mind to be anything so glamorous as a conductor. Unedited. Let it ring. I mean, you, know, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. I mean, it's natural, sure. It's... Why don't you take this off the hook? <laughs> OK. Uh, you were saying you never had any ambitions to be a conductor. Anything that's so glamorous as a conductor. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, in those days, a conductor meant uh, that tiny little figure, namely Kusevitsky, that I would see from the second balcony when I was lucky enough to get, get sneak in or, or <laughs> rush seats. Or rush seats on Friday afternoon, yes. or sometimes somebody had a ticket who wasn't able to go, and that was wonderful because then I didn't have to stand at the very, very back, at the very, very top of Symphony Hall. But anyway, the, um, it was actually Dmitry Metropolis who taught me into studying, conducting, being a conductor. And that was after I graduated from college. So all that time, I had no idea I was ever going to conduct, least of all, to conduct anything as uh, complicated and profound and hair-raising as a Mahler symphony or song cycle or anything else. But my feelings about Mahler were instantaneous. I felt some identification with with Das Lied from the first bar and the first utterance of the tenor. Seeing about the wine, but don't drink it yet. Schon blinkt der Wein im goldenen Pokal. Doch trink noch nicht, erst sing ich euch ein Lied. First I'll sing you a song. And I was, with the little German I had at the time, I was uh, trapped. And that lead, 
uh, became part of my corpuscles, my molecules, genes, and never. Um, I didn't hear much bother other than that because Kuspiski didn't play very much. He okay. played the, the Adagetta for the Fifth Symphony, who had played the two Nachtmusiken from the Seventh Symphony. Do you know that he did the American premiere of the Ninth? Kuspiski no. did no. our. No, yes, no, that's yes. Not possible. yes, indeed. 1932. He's not given credit for the kind Why of I don't know that. <laughs> like, this is Why are you embarrassing me on air in front of all these people? <laughs> I mean, because he was my best friend for one whole decade, the yes. last decade of his life. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Mahler a lot. He was present when I did the Resurrection Symphony with the uh, Boston, Boston Symphony. Symphony. And of course, I did it after he died in his memory. Yes. He also, as a matter of fact, had scheduled, it never came off, but he had scheduled the American premiere of the 6th in the mid-1930s. Then there were some problems with scores and it just never happened. Hmm. No, you really amazed me with this information about the night. I know that Bruno Walter was the only conductor who knew it, having given the, um, the world premiere in Vienna. But uh, it was a disaster, that world premiere. And he was so frightened of it that after he left Vienna and came to this country, he didn't perform it uh, for decades. Mm. Well, until the 50s or something like that. He didn't dare play it until he made that recording, I think, for CBS. There was also a concert recording of a performance that he made just days before the Anschluss in 38 with the Vienna Philharmonic. And that's now out on CD, as a matter of fact. Goodness. The things I am learning on this program. Kuzvitsky <laughs> conducting the ninth. I mean, it doesn't seem possible. Erase this, please, Hank. <laughs> um, this is all just bumbling. That's extraordinary. Yeah. That's amusing. A work, a symphony of Mahler's that I still have trouble with is the seventh. And I have trouble with You're it. You're not alone. Except when you do it. Uh, suddenly flatter it. No, right from my heart. Things that seem amorphous and disconnected and, and not really Mahler. Especially in the finale. Finale, oh, yeah, that is so tough. It's a, keep hanging together. But you know what the secret of that is? I mean, there are a thousand secrets, musical secrets, I won't bore you with, but, but one of the chief secrets <coughs> is to understand the irony of it. See, most conductors take it literally, and, and it, the, those charming minuets that keep appearing over and over again, in between the stormy march music and fanfare, it doesn't seem to make much sense. And then they appear again, and just when you think it's over, no, not at all, groan, it's going on, and yet another little charming minuet appears until the audience gets quite restive and begins to reach for its scarves and rubbers. <laughs> but um, if you understand that this has all been ironically, and this is painting a picture of a decadent Vienna, which is about to explode in the First World War. Uh, it's extraordinarily prophetic. And what he is showing you is the pomp and circumstance of the Habsburg Empire with all these parades, the kind of fanfares and marches, uh, which are rather blatant and empty, and that's on purpose, mm -hmm. interspersed with these kind of Dainty minuets which depict social life in Vienna and the hypocritical kind of grace of the way the Viennese lived until the war blew them all apart. After that uh, miraculously vivid description of the finale of the seventh, I'm a little shamefaced to say that what I had thought we would play would be the first of the two night music movements in Mahler Seven. Um, how do you feel about that? Oh, that's glorious. That's a really haunting piece. 
or the scherzo in between the two night yes. musics yes. is one of the most amazing nightmares of all time. That is not night music in itself, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what? Let's hear the scherzo from Mahler's... And bear in mind the Schubert A minor piano sonata from which it's almost literally stolen. The scherzo movement from the Symphony No. 7 by Gustav Mahler, recorded in concert by Deutsche Grammophon in Avery Fisher Hall in November and December 1985. Leonard Bernstein conducts the New York Philharmonic. Well, we're not going to hear it today, but that was the lead up and the build up to it. <laughs> 